Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Adam Green here with No More News. Dot org. Today is Monday, March 23rd, 2020. Another day of pandemic pandemonium. And joining me to talk about the latest news and some of her thoughts and investigative research on the coronavirus is the one, the only writer, researcher, and soon to be author, formerly at Mint Press News, Miss Whitney Webb who's now writing for Unlimited Hangout. Thanks for uh, coming on, Whitney. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Well, I've been following you on Twitter, and I noticed that you're not at Mint Press News anymore. So why don't you tell us about uh, you've gone um, independent now? Yeah, so um, I'm decided to do you know my own thing, sort of do a more relaxed uh, schedule, um, and and do some more like bigger investigative stuff. Um, I'm going to be publishing at my own site that I just set up. It's kind of rudimentary, right? So like the design's really basic. I hope to make it you know snazzier at some point in the future, but I'll be publishing some stuff there. But most of my stuff from now on is going to be up at the Last American Vagabond dot com, um, and so you can find uh, most of my work there going forward. Cool. Yeah, I've been on uh, Ryan's show, Last American Vagabond, and he's been on a few times. So good to see that you're uh, going to be right. publishing <laughs> over there. And, and your articles are normally picked up and republished all over the place. Yeah, sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> all right. Well, um, uh, oh, and, and tell us about your new website as well. Oh, I think I mentioned it a little bit. It's just something I set up um, in case I publish at some other sites too, sort of a place to have all my future work anyway, um, you know, all in one place. Um, before that, all of my work pretty much was published just at Mint Press News. So, you know, the, use in, the archive of that would just be my author page at Mint Press, but all the stuff going forward, whether it's for some, you know, other sites I contribute to besides, you know, Ryan's page and things like that, it'll be, it'll all be there. Cool. Yeah. You used to have a a Whitney Webb section on uh, nomorenews.org until I redesign my my homepage. <laughs> but uh, so I want to you've got this new article out about uh, continuity of government and I want to get into that but but first I want to back up it, you did an article a while back about Operation Blackout and I and the company uh, Cyber Reason you've been covering them a lot I did a video it looks like yeah. 2 months ago Operation Blackout, Israel Hacking America. Um, why don't you tell us about uh, a little bit about Cyber Reason and how they were pre predicting, um, like, kind of the that the elections would get messed up, and then this how that connects to this tweet. Right. So it wasn't just Cyber Reason that was predicting the elections were going to be messed up. It was pretty much in the U.S. too. Every intelligence agency, DHS, the DOJ, they were putting out all these statements warning that the 2020 election was going to, you know, be subjected to unprecedented foreign interference. And they issued this joint statement. And then a couple paragraphs down, they admit that they don't have any evidence uh, for putting for making those claims, but they're telling you, you know, in advance to get you prepared for this election season to be chaotic. And at the same time, we have a company like Cyber Reason, which is advised by, you know, some former CIA and like, you know, intelligence spooks from the U.S., but is basically, you know, for all intents and purposes, a front company for Israeli intelligence, openly doing these simulations um, about how, you know, there's going to be this insane chaos in election day and beforehand that the elections are going to be canceled, that there's going to be these huge cyber attacks, cyber attacks and, and hacks on critical infrastructure in the U.S. Um, and the first simulation, well, they did several simulations last year, but the one that really got my attention and got me writing about them was one they did last November, where they basically simulated taking controls of city buses and ramming them into civilians waiting in line to vote. Um, they most recently did one in February in New Hampshire right before the primary, where they tried to hack the sewage system and flood the streets with raw sewage so people wouldn't go vote, um, which is pretty crazy. And as time has gone on, they also tweeted out stuff about um, coronavirus and how coronavirus could up in the 2020 election. And they were calling for more, to do simulations of coronavirus in the 2020 election. And after an hour, they deleted the, their article and their tweet. I only got a screenshot of the tweet that I, I tweeted it out. Um, and they acted, yeah, so you just pulled it up. And they're talking about um you know, fake news is a problem, cyber terrorism, all this stuff, cyber reason as a company, 
along with Microsoft and U.S. intelligence, has basically set up a lot of countries to take the fall for this. Not surprisingly, um, Iran is like the main one that they're basically fingering in advance for all of this. And what's also telling, too, is that the Department of Health and Human Services not that long ago reported being hacked by what they said was a hostile foreign actor. And they haven't... um, determined who that is but i think when they say who did it we should be very skeptical of who they're blaming because they have this narrative as i detail in my series on cyber reason they've had this narrative set up you know so long in advance cyber reason is just one of these companies that's connected to intelligence like pushing this out and you know for people that haven't read my series, the reason why I say Cyber Reason is a front company for Israeli intelligence. It was all co-founded by Unit 8200 guys. Um, the CEO, who was also one of the co-founders, uh, says that his work at Cyber Reason is a continuation, that's a quote from him, a continuation of his service to Israeli military intelligence. So, I mean, that's was pretty much a, a, as obvious uh, of an admission as you're going to get. And not only that, they also have a an intelligence working group of active Unit 8200 members that work for Cyber Reason and look at hacks and malware malware attacks that go on in the world and assign blame for those to nation states, right? So anytime this company is going to tell you that this, you know, nation state was responsible for a hack, be very skeptical. And also, um, I should point out their CEO, this guy who says that his work there is a continuation of, of his uh, time at Cyber Reason, he used to lead Unit 8200's of, uh, offensive hacking unit targeting nation states. So this guy is a professional hacker that attacks nation states. They, they're they openly simulating, you know, chaos in, in the U.S., uh, you know, um, uh, like a, a election system and basically predi- tr- planning out ways to uh, create a crisis of faith in the U.S. government, which is really happening on its own anyway. I mean, the U.S. government is doing that, you know, well enough on itself. But a lot of these simulations they're doing and, and the statements that people from Cyber Reason have been putting out about like Iowa, what happened there and things like that. They say, look how mm-hmm. fragile U.S. faith and democracy is. Look how easy it is to create chaos and you know, and, and making really odd statements and wasn't like that. that. Wasn't that and like also, a, in Ohio, <laughs> there was a election app software that was run by like a, 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 a in Zionist, Iowa, right? Yeah, it was Seth Klarman was the guy behind it. Seth Klarman, who owns the Times of Israel and is a funder of the most extreme settlements in the West Bank that are also have been funded by the Kushner family, including the people that wrote the King's Torah, which was, you know, talking about killing uh, Palestinian babies before they can threaten uh you know jewish israelis you know just crazy Mm -hmm. stuff so you know these are the people uh you know that really put that stuff in in motion and the name of that company in in iowa was called like shadow inc or something i mean what a what a ridiculous name i don't know it's like almost comic book level uh craziness but anyway uh, one thing i want to say about cyber reasons election simulations Cyber Reason officially is a cybersecurity company. They sell, you know, like a, a glorified version of antivirus software that's run by AI and, and all this stuff. So what they do in their simulations, they don't involve voting machines or any other type of aspect of the electoral process where they could market their software to, to make it safer. They specifically exclude that. So they have no financial incentive as a company to run these simulations. And these simulations involve top U.S. government officials, right? So this is like some high-level crap. And they don't have any economic incentive. They claim to just be doing it out of altruism because they want to help protect American democracy. I mean, like, mm-hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> um, at least that's that's my take on it. But I think all of that is important to consider as a whole when we're talking about cyber reason. And their interest in coronavirus and, and the craziness there and the fact they deleted that tweet after like an hour, I think that's uh, pretty this telling. This was, I uh, see personally. you shared it March 12th. When, they posted this after the coronavirus was already a thing in the news? It was just becoming like, uh, you know, the 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 pandemonium, I guess, right, that has since manifested was just starting when they put that out. And then they deleted it after an hour. Why would you delete the article and the tweet after such a short period of and time? And why would, uh, you know? like, um, a, a, a company that's running hacking simulations say something like this about coronavirus? It, like, this is exactly what they were they were predicting and running in their simulations, like just total chaos, no faith in the media, total demoralization, 
no and, and so the elections ultimately get canceled and it's looking like that might happen right. we just had tax day get pushed back i could see that happening yeah not long after after this article came out there were articles in foreign policy magazine which is you know run by the cfr saying we have to cancel the 2020 election and stuff so these guys were kind of ahead of the curve i guess you could say when it came to election day chaos and, and coronavirus. And I actually read this article they deleted. I didn't think they deleted it so quickly, otherwise I would have web archived it. But they were talking about, we need to run new simulations with government officials and promote public-private partnerships between companies like Cyber Reason and, and the government to keep us safe and all this stuff. I mean, really Orwellian when you consider the fact too, the same intelligence apparatus to which cyber reason belongs is a history of aggressive espionage against the United States and the U.S. government. They are not our ally. These are people that spy on the U.S. all the time, aggressively so. They just had, you know, all those towers around the White House spying on the president and people that work in the executive branch. I mean, it's just really um, crazy to give these guys so much power. And they also essentially have a backdoor running on a lot of the most classified networks and U.S. military and intelligence Um you know, and on those systems, they, they, uh, their software is installed on computers for the NSA, the CIA, um, a bunch of sensitive military equipment. Um, it, it's just really crazy that th this company is so, you know, plugged into every, to all this stuff. And they're making these, these creepy predictions about how this is going to be like the last election. It's going to be canceled and American democracy will never recover and all this stuff. I mean, uh, just really wild. We're putting America's security completely in the hands of a foreign country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I actually argue in a lot of my pieces that are about this is that this is about building a binational security state because there's a lot of people on companies, cyber reasons, one of them, right, um, that have a lot of connections to Israeli intelligence, but also connections to the CIA and U.S. intelligence or, you know, big tech companies in the U.S. And they're basically coming together. So like cyber reason too, one of their biggest investors is Lockheed Martin. I mean, that's a U.S. company, right? And, Lo and Lockheed was the vehicle through which they got installed in all these government computers and, and these important networks. So really it's, it's an effort by, you know, these uh, the people that are in charge of these companies in the private sector and the military industrial complexes and intelligence apparatus of both countries sort of being smushed together, right? And and when Paul Singer um, set up, you know, Startup Nation Central to get, you know, all these tech jobs, uh, key tech jobs in the U.S. switched over to Israel, that was about preventing people in the U.S. and in other countries from boycotting Israel, right? So, I mean, this is all about sort of mushing it mushing both states together and making it impossible really uh, to criticize or boycott, you know, either of them. It's funny you mentioned Paul Singer because um, Clearview is a company, the facial recognition company that was founded by uh, a Chabad Lubavitch Giuliani aide lawyer and this like young Asian yeah. guy. And they, they met at the Manhattan Institute where Paul Singer is on the board. And it was founded by uh, yeah. Woolsey, right? Who was the... Oh, uh, James, James Woolsey, the former CIA yeah. director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's on the board of Genie Energy. With all, I mean, I have video yeah, it's of such him. a small group when you look he at it. Right? At Habba, a big Chabad Lubavitch event with Lieberman, where Lieberman was on stage wow. and said, Chabad is uh, bigger than the CIA. Like Avangor Lieberman or Joseph Lieberman, which one? Oh, the VP and uh, Congressman Lieberman. Oh, right. Okay. So, all right. Um, let me see here. This this tweet then. So this tweet is pretty ominous, given all everything you just talked about, saying that yeah. he's just saying what's above the surface. So there's a lot more that he's not telling us. Vast changes are coming because Israel is now a power to contend with. So that means vast changes to the world are coming. And because of collaboration with yep. Israel helps you prepare. In other words, secure the future of your purple uh, people, 14 words much, <laughs> and ensure a better future for your people. He, this sounds like mafia tactics, like you better work with us and go along with us. Otherwise, there's no future for you in the world to come, basically. Not just future for you, future for yeah. your people. I mean, this is when this tweet came out, I tweeted this and I was like, what the heck is going on? What is he saying now with, you know, what's going on with coronavirus? There's a couple things I'd like to uh, point out. 
not only has, has Netanyahu secured his ability to stay in power basically for as long as he wants with emergency powers, there's a lot of creepy policies that they've been doing in relation to this, this virus. Let's just look at Palestine, for example. As soon as the outbreak started to get bad, Israel stopped giving cleaning supplies to Palestinian prisoners, soap and, and basic things, you know, for, for hygiene purposes. And now there's an outbreak of coronavirus in Palestinian prisons, right? Or uh, prisons in Israel of Palestinian prisoners, a lot of whom are just in prison without any charges as part of administrative detention. Now there's an outbreak in Gaza. And uh, how are, you know, Gaza's under siege, basically, and under a blockade. How are they going to get... Um, mm -hmm you know, all the supplies they need to treat that. There's millions of people that live there. Their hospitals are already hugely understaffed and Israel closely controls who comes in and who leaves. So how did coronavirus even get into Gaza since they've had the borders essentially closed um, over the past few months? I mean, I just think um, there's some shady stuff going on there, especially when we consider too that Israel, not long after all this, um, revealed itself with coronavirus, right? There was this government funded institute called Megal that uh, announced that they already basically have a vaccine and they claimed in the article that it was quote unquote mm -hmm. pure luck that they have it, um, you know, almost ready to go when vaccine development generally takes like a year to a year and a half to do. Um, so pretty, pretty crazy that they, um, you know, already have it essentially ready to go as they're claiming. I mean, we'll see if that's really true or not. But this whole thing about securing the existence um, oh, of your people. <laughs> yeah. they'll, they'll clip you if you <laughs> say that all outright. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't have a YouTube yeah. channel, so <laughs> I don't normally worry about well, Look <laughs> that at what stuff. they're doing with Iran. Should. They're saying, like, you know, they're not going to lift any of the sanctions or the blockades, you know. Yeah. Well, I was going to get there. One thing that's really odd when you're looking about how coronavirus has man manifested in different countries in Iran, right away, who got hit first? The political leadership of Iran, a bunch of top politicians, top advisors to the Ayatollahs, Ayatollahs themselves were the were among the first people to really get hit and, and die from this virus. I think that's really significant because we haven't seen major political leaders die in any other country but Iran. And at the same time, while all of this stuff is going on, we've had the U.S., whose foreign policy with respect to Iran is dominated by neocons and, and the Israel lobby, uh, put, a, put further sanctions on Iran, basically. And then we had Mossad not that long ago say, hey, we acquired on this complex mission in a country with which we don't have diplomatic relations, all of these coronavirus tests. Well, you know, people were saying, oh, that, that must mean the Gulf countries and all that stuff. But why would you need to use Mossad and send them on what they called a complex mission to get, you know, to get supplies from a country like Saudi Arabia or the UAE where they already have diplomatic back channels? You know what I mean? And they already do diplomacy and, and economic deals privately, even though they, they don't have, quote unquote, public ties, you know. So to me, that says maybe they took some of those tests from Iran. And that wasn't widely covered at all. It just like, you know, like, like, like you just pull up, it got covered in Bloomberg and maybe some, a couple Israeli outlets and really not, not much attention was paid to why, why is Mossad so interested in, in virus tests? I'm not saying that I think, you know, uh, you know, Israel is behind this. I certainly don't think there's evidence for that at this point, but I think they are definitely Israel's leadership. Obviously Netanyahu is milking this crisis for all it's worth. And I would say that a lot of other governments in the world are doing the same. Uh, something, an interesting pattern that I've noticed personally is that a lot of the first countries to go on lockdown for coronavirus um, were countries that all had major protest movements that now, because of, you know, mandatory national quarantine, those protest movements have basically disappeared. Uh, an example, France uh, was put on lockdown really early on. Uh, the Yellow Vests, uh, you know, they now can't be on the streets because of coronavirus. Spain was next. Um, Spain had the, all the Catalonia protests in Barcelona. Chile, where I live, uh, followed not that long afterwards. Uh, Chile has been having major anti-government protests since last October. Um, so I think that's an interesting coincidence when you think about it. And Israel has also done, you know, this lockdown and mandated a lot of these uh, very Orwellian policies like surveillance, mass surveillance tracking um, of civilians in the name of coronavirus, giving Israel's government a bunch of um, a bunch of new powers. And just the other day, the Knesset, you know, Israel's Congress basically were debating whether or not to suspend all individual liberties 
for all citizens of Israel, not just, you know, Palestinians who basically don't have any rights respected by, you know, the Israeli state anyway, but even for Jewish Israelis, I mean, that's really unprecedented. Um, and what was interesting is that in Israel, it was all these tools that were surveillance tools that were developed for counterterrorism purposes. Now they're going to be used to fight the virus, right? And I think we're seeing a lot of that being pushed in the U.S. as well. All the stuff that was previously for nine, uh, post 9-11, the war on terror is now being justified. Its expansion and continuation is being justified as, oh, we have to fight the virus now. The virus is the new enemy. We've moved from the invisible in enemy of, you know, that terrorist thousands of miles away to now the invisible coronavirus and we have to give up all our freedoms, basically. I was just going to make that exact point. It's like, just like <clears throat> Al-Qaeda and the terrorists were kind of like an invisible enemy that was just like pushed everywhere in the media. Now, now they're doing the same thing here. And it's like, I was looking for the article, but Trump uh, declared war declared war on uh they're calling it war basically and i saw a tweet from lindsey graham about like bomb them something like he's talking about bombing it was i'll i'll look it up it was in it was like starve yeah. it yeah i saw the lindsey graham tweet it said starve it bomb it yeah. and kill it was his coronavirus strategy i was like what uh, that is a crazy way to frame fighting again, you know, the stuff against a virus. But honestly, across the board right now in the U.S. and in a lot of other countries, they are framing a lot of their rhetoric about how to combat the coronavirus in a very militaristic way um, that I think should really be concerning. They make a lot of allusions to World War II and wartime preparations. And this is war. Coronavirus is an invisible enemy. Be very careful when the government starts to do that. That means they're going to ask for wartime powers. Um, you know, uh, it's just the militarization of this response to the pandemic. I think people should be very careful of what they are asking for. A lot of people, I had people, I, I did this thread yesterday because I had a bunch of people in my mentions basically saying, hey, you know what? A military takeover of the U.S. sounds totally awesome right now because Trump is incompetent, blah, 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 or, you know, and people aren't staying in quarantine. I mean, be very careful what you're asking for because every time... You know, even if you just look at 9-11, all the civil liberties that, you know, got taken away then uh, out of under the guise of fighting terrorism, we never got back. We never got them back. And uh, terrorism exploded and got way worse. And uh, now the U.S. is basically allied with Al Qaeda in Syria and Yemen. Uh, but we gave up all our civil liberties to fight them, right? So anytime the government comes asking for major civil liberties uh, to be taken away from the people in order to, quote unquote, keep us safe, I mean, you need to be skeptical, pay attention to historical precedent. Now the Department of Justice, led by William Barr, who is like a, a corrupt piece of shit, basically, I can't really think of any other way to phrase it right now, um, He's asking for powers to indefinitely indefinitely detain Americans and pause court mm -hmm. proceedings. And basically, last year I reported that Bill Barr uh, was had created a pre-crime program that they were going to put into effect this year. So they can arrest you. You don't even have to plan or, or plan to commit a crime or commit a crime. They just have to think you are, quote unquote, mobilizing towards violence uh, in order to arrest you, that is that that's already been implemented in at least one state in Nevada. Uh, they they've had that go live already, and now he's asking for power to indefinitely de detain Americans. On top of that, um, and, and and in his request for new powers, one of the things he said in there was uh, to pause, you know, normal uh, just like legal proceedings for um, all processes, um, all, all of the legal processes involved in an arrest and prosecution. And he uses the term pre-arrest. So even before they arrest you and, and this guy Politico was, you know, the first to really report on this request by the Department of Justice and the person they cited who's like this head of uh, like a criminal uh, defense lawyer network or something. He was like, oh, yeah, that means they can basically just uh, take you in your house and put you in prison for as long as they want until they decide the quote unquote state of emergency ends. And Trump already declared a state of emergency over coronavirus. Right. So as soon as the Department of Justice gets those powers, if they do, um, we could really be looking at a very unprecedented uh, you know, case in the U.S. for sure. Um, and uh, I think people should be very wary about giving all of that power to the state, to the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the U.S. government is so ridiculously corrupt, and William Barr is, is insanely corrupt, and so to, like, to give him all of this power is just, like, it's nuts.
I mean, if you think these people want to protect you from from a pandemic illness and and, and keep you healthy and, and stuff, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, turn back on Fox News, I guess. You shouldn't be watching this channel if you think that's that's what the government, you know, wants for you. You know, uh, QAnon people are actually promoting the idea of martial law because they they think it's a cover for Trump to go after the deep state and round up the deep state. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I've seen that too. I think that's a, a bunch of bull crap. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, mainly because if you look at Trump, right? Yeah. So he's the president, but who uh, is his administration stuffed with? They're stuffed with neocons, right? Neocons have been planning for an emergency situation like this since the 1980s and the Reagan administration, which was when a lot of these, you know, well-known neocons first rose to like major positions of power. And that's when they developed um, continuity of government plans that involve, uh, you know, it, suspending the constitution indefinitely and imposing a, a, like a new type of government where there's no legislative branch at all. And, and, and you know, going through a lot of these really, uh, you know, just plans that are, are just so insane and and really dangerous and basically use this database called main core that i talk about in, in my latest article that has a list of any american that even for the most trivial of reasons can be deemed unfriendly by the u.s government you know it, it detain people like that indefinitely which Barr is already asking to do um, those people that came up with those plans in the 1980s, which even QAnon people would call, quote unquote, deep state, those same factions and a lot of those same people are in power in the Trump administration mm -hmm. right now. Like Bill Barr, you know, one of the people most involved in, in the continuity of government planning in the 1980s was Bill Casey of the CIA. Bill Barr, uh, during the Iran-Contra scandal, worked as a, as a liaison for Bill Casey. Prior to that, he worked for the CIA covering up um, investigations of the CIA during the church committee. He did the Iran-Contra cover-up when he was attorney general the first time under George H.W. Bush who is like ridiculous, ridiculously corrupt, also involved in continuity of government planning under Reagan when he when Bush was vice president. I mean, how how, how is putting uh, Bill Barr in charge of, you know, who gets detained and who doesn't fighting the deep state? He is the deep state. You know what I mean? So like people that are, are thinking that they are living in, in this this bubble of fantasy where they're basically thinking that this this government right now is going to be the good guys and they're going to arrest everyone bad. I mean, that is just some comic book mm -hmm. shit. That is not how the real world works um, at all. It, it, I, I mean, I just I, I almost don't even know what to say to those people. I don't even know if they're even worth reaching well, at this point. I think they are worth <laughs> reaching because I used to I, I don't normally talk about these QAnon people, but I'm noticing they're getting so many views and, and, and having influence right now, especially in the response to this coronavirus. And I, I think it's just so incredibly dangerous what they're doing. They, they try to frame it. You know what I think is really telling there, though, is that the fact that those videos are not getting censored to hell by the crazy algorithms they're <clears> putting <throat> in now and all the extreme censorship measures tells you that the quote unquote deep state or whatever in charge of that censorship likes the message they're putting out and wants that to spread around. Why all the other channels that are seeing stuff and questioning the government's motives are being censored to an extent we've never seen before. And we're probably going to see in a couple of weeks, maybe even sooner, uh, extreme deplatforming come to Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. Um, all of those companies, well, in YouTube's case, Google, right, met, met with intelligence agencies last year and talked about how they were going to protect public discourse ahead of the 2020 election and and combat disinformation. And they, did, they came out and said the same thing about combating disinformation about mm -hmm. coronavirus. So, I mean, if you think, um, I mean, if they're going to deplatform people like me for that, but they're not going to deplatform the QAnon people, I mean, I think that tells you a lot. They want that message out there. They want people begging for martial law yeah. for whatever reason, whether they think it's going to keep them safe from coronavirus or it's going to mean all the deep state pedophiles get arrested. You, you, I don't know. I mean, Bill Barr didn't do anything with the Epstein investigation. Yeah. Galene Maxwell is hiding somewhere, probably in Israel, and they haven't done shit. And that investigation, the FBI's investigation, is a total farce. It's totally just like 
non-existent basically so i mean if you think that guy is gonna round up all the baddies for you and like you know be like a comic book superhero and and put all the bad guys in jail i mean i mean really i i don't i don't know I don't, I don't even Conspir- <laughs> I don't what, what I think is weird like about that QAnon is that conspiracy theories, you know, quote, conspiracy theories always used to be that the government was conspiring to do something bad. This is a conspiracy that the government is secretly good and everything's 3D chess and they're going after this, this supposed deep state, which these QAnon people just basically frame it as the Democrats are, are the deep state. And like, you know, a faction of the, the right wing and that Trump and the Patriots yeah. are the ones... Trump is just, you know, it's so swampy and so tied in with like these these mafias that it's just it's ridiculous. It's fan fiction. I want to shift gears to some of the rights that they are definitely going to try to capitalize. You know, it's never let a crisis go to waste, whether it's a genuine crisis yeah. or manufactured. Let's talk about some of the stuff that they're talking about doing and that you think they're going to rights they're going to take away or new new, uh, you know, Orwellian policies that they're going to enact. Oh, man, where do I start with the rights they're taking away? Well, I already talked about indefinite detention. I mean, that right away, that's, you know, you lose the right to a free trial. I mean, right there, I mean, habeas corpus out the window. It already kind of was after 9-11 a little bit. But now, I mean, they're just opening the doors to it to like just be a memory for everyone. Um, which I think is really dangerous. The other thing too, the censorship on social media um, is going to be an attack on free speech for sure. They're also, you know, surveilling people. They want to expand surveillance programs, all of that surveillance stuff and everything you say on social media, that, that is all plugged into this pre-crime dragnet that Bill Barr and, and these, um, you know, you, uh, Israeli and U.S. intelligence leak tech companies have been setting up. I talk about that in this article that I did last year. I highly recommend people revisit it. It's called uh, How the CIA, Mossad, and the Epstein Network are Exploiting uh, Mass Shootings to Create an Orwellian Nightmare. I think that's the full title. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, in there, I lay out a lot of what they're trying to push out now, which is, you know, uh, mass surveillance. It, 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 and not just mass surveillance to see what you're saying now, but to be able to predict your future behavior. Let's remember, too, last year, the FBI came out and said conspiracy theorists are a domestic terror threat, mm-hmm. basically saying that anyone that doesn't believe government narratives, whether those are about past events or current events, um, can be con- dis- uh, determined to be you know, a-, a threat to the public order. And a lot of what Bill Barr is saying now about individuals mobilizing towards violence, I mean, you, that's so vague that it could on- honestly be used uh, against anyone who, who expresses discontent or displeasure with the government or a specific policy. That's kind of you know? how it is in China right now. Right. Well, China, China is the model for where the U.S. is going. I mean, I think honestly what we're seeing, too, with coronavirus, we're seeing a lot of this nation state against nation state. But let's remember that the real levers of power exist above the nation state level. I mean, there's a global oligarchy. Um, that's why you see China and the U.S. partnering with people like Bill Gates, you know, and things like that to, quote unquote, solve the corona, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, China's social credit score uh, system and mass surveillance system. I mean, all of that they are trying to make globally with the complicity of the U.S. government and all these other governments that are trying to do this. I mean, this is what they want. These, all these governments, communist, fascist, whatever you want to call them, it's all about authoritarianism. It's all about creating authoritarian societies that are technocracies, essentially, um, and and just eviscerating liberty um, in in all of its forms, <laughs> basically. And and it's it's really dangerous. Um, so, you know, a lot of this about China and the U.S. having this war on words type of thing. At the end of the day, what both of those governments want is what they're trying to push through now with coronavirus as the excuse, which is mass surveillance, tracking people, tracking what you say, limiting free speech, limiting freedom of movement, limiting pretty much every freedom uh, you can think of so they can hold on to power. I mean, continuity of government, right, uh, was just recently resurfaced as a term. Um, You know, I was talking about the plans for that, uh, for martial law and all that, that were developed back by the neocons that are still in power today, uh, right? But all continuity of government isn't about continuity of the constitution. It's about continuity of the government, i.e. keeping the powers that be in power and keeping the system as it is in place. Right. So those the fact they're talking in the mainstream now about those type of plans going live. I mean, be very be very careful 
um, about supporting, you know, what, what comes out of that, you know, because the U.S. is on a path right now if, with the emergency powers it's seeking where there really isn't going to be much difference between, quote unquote, authoritarian China and, quote unquote, authoritarian USA. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, one calls itself communist and one calls itself capitalist. OK, whatever. Um, but honestly, there's been so much, so many moves just in the past couple of weeks in the U.S. about public private partnerships to fight coronavirus, where a bunch of corporations are basically fusing with the state in a lot of ways. Uh, big tech companies already kind of do that, allowing the government to determine, and you know, who they censor and who they don't, or foreign governments in the case of the ADL's involvement um, in censorship the, and stuff like that. ADL, right? <clears throat> the ADL was asking for a bailout for charities on Twitter yesterday. So I, so I assume including what? themselves. Yeah. They, okay, they're yeah, they're yeah, shekel <laughs> grabbing out of this crisis as well. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, they're ridiculous. Um, they, they have so much money. I mean, they were funded by people like the Bronfmans and the Lauders and like the richest, some of the richest people in the world throwing money at them for decades. And, and now they, they want some of the bailout money. Okay. Gr Greenblatt I, I just... makes more than half a million a year. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I've, I've if I remember correctly, they make they bring bring in like a hundred million in donations a year, or something like that. So, um, yeah, you mentioned I think the first thing you mentioned with the rights being taken away is, is increased censorship online. They are very I'm seeing it everywhere about how they're trying to counter the misinformation. So that'll be definitely implemented. And also they've announced that they're doing more censorship, that they're having to rely more on the uh, algorithms, the ADL and trust project, like you wrote about created yeah. algorithms. Yeah. It's all about moving, moving all this, all this stuff to artificial intelligence. So it's not just people in charge of it. Um, and, and basically automating this whole like control grid, whatever you want to call it, they're setting up, whether that's, you know, the social media angle or this new law enforcement angle of it that Bill Barr has been involved in setting up with pre-crime or companies like Palantir, Peter Thiel's Palantir, which is involved with intelligence and about in DHS and a bunch of other agencies, you know, it, it, it's all artificial intelligence based, not really to have people, um, you know, regular human operators making decisions. It's about writing the algorithm and, and giving it all over to the machine. And uh, Israel is really, you know, has through this, you know, um, patronage of people like Paul Singer and all this money that's been thrown at their cybersecurity and cyber startups and, and all this stuff have really, um, you know, done a bunch of AI stuff and really dominate that field in a lot of ways. So, I mean, a lot of those AI algorithms are being written in Israel by people with ties to Israeli intelligence or Israeli military intelligence. Um, so I think that is really significant and definitely concerning. Yeah. Also, an interesting thing, um, when, when I was writing about a lot about, you know, um, their the Israeli startup scene uh, in their connections to intelligence and the military and all of that. There was one field that didn't really make a lot of sense about why they were so invested uh, in, in startups in the healthcare field. Uh, but now it's starting to make more sense because a lot of those uh, companies that have really benefited from the coronavirus, like telemedicine or uh, remote uh, hospital visits and all this stuff, a lot of those are Israeli startups that now are making a killing and their stock prices have just exploded as coronavirus has gone on. Um, so I think that's pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, I remember noticing that too. Like it's it, the, all the tech companies that uh, the Israelis and the startups were focused on. A lot of them were healthcare, and then now we're seeing this big uh, health crisis coming about. And I remember uh, just came to my mind. Ivanka Kushner was talking about uh, healthcare, and she wants some huge database to track everybody's uh, health systems. Um, Kushner is involved with the healthcare industry as well with this company with his brother that uh, is, I believe, involved with the website and the testing, the testing right. kits as well as, as outlined in this article. And Right. It, it, it was co-founded by his brother, but Jared Kushner was apparently like uh, on, on, on the books down as like uh, having a key leadership role in that company. And his name disappeared not that long before the recent crisis, um, from what I understand. So <clears throat> how, how convenient for him, right? Um, 
But with Ivanka Trump calling for that type of database, let's remember, too, that not, not that long ago, she was calling and lobbying her dad, the president, for the creation of this new agency called HARPA, right. which was going to be about analyzing people, uh, analyzing um, their medical histories and their comments made online on social media and things like that for mental health purposes to try and identify people that might be violent and might conduct mass shootings, mm -hmm. right? which at the same time that Bill Barr was creating this, you know, pre-crime program for the same purpose, but now it's not about mass shootings anymore. Um, it's about, you know, people that could be potentially spreading the virus. There was this article that came out not that long ago where the FBI is saying that now you have to worry about neo-Nazis licking coronavirus on your doorknobs and, and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? So they're like setting up a really, I mean, honestly, if you take the time, to objectively think about this and, and you like don't think about this from the perspective of like the national panic you know we're in saying that neo-nazi groups are going around licking doorknobs to give people coronavirus i mean just sounds absurd right but you know and, yeah. and you know what else i saw somebody retweeting that and then they they got it they did a, like an advanced search on twitter and there's all these people joking around joking about going and coughing on white people and stuff so it, and it shows that the feds are in telegram like you know po probably posting stuff trying to provoke people you know which we know it's not even a question that they do that they so try to find their yeah policies. So the FBI and I, almost every terrorism arrest they have made uh, since 9-11 has been has involved FBI informants uh, grooming and goading on the people they eventually arrest to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. It happens a lot in American Muslim communities. It happens also, um, you know, with young white men mm -hmm. um, that the. the, the and neo-Nazi groups are so infiltrated by the federal government and the FBI and the CIA. I mean, it's just, um, uh, it's really comical, I think, to think that, you know, they're planning, have all these plans in secret that the, that the feds don't know about. I mean, those groups are just so, it's so documented how infiltrated they are that I think that threat is really overblown. But then you have like, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center um, stoking fear about that all the time. But if you actually look at their numbers, I mean, it's a very small amount of individuals that they end up talking about if you actually look at it uh, on the scale of like, you know, uh, the nation. Well, for, for an <laughs> example, like the, the pictures they always use is always from Charlottesville 2017. It's not like there's like, this is just prevalent everywhere and they've got all this institutional power it's just and if if anybody were to say the same same accusations about uh israelis or, or jewish people you know the adl would come after you hard but i mean this is all about divide and conquer right so it's like okay after 9 11 we all have to be scared of muslims and then um you know create this division between muslim americans and the rest of americans and now it's Oh, the new boogeyman are uh, young white men. So we have to create division between, you know, uh, people that are white and everyone else, you know, just to keep everyone divided and angry at each other and ignoring the people on top that are doing all this crazy stuff and, and creating, you know, these taking away freedoms of everyone on both sides of the divide and, and ushering in a very Orwellian future. But a lot of people, sadly, on Twitter are basically just like begging for. I hope that's not common in the U.S. on a massive scale, as I've seen it on Twitter lately, um, of people just begging for the government to come and, and save them mm -hmm. um, and, and all this stuff. Just really, um, really depressing to see so many people assuming that having the military on the streets is going to make all of this go away. Um, I know. I mean, it, it, the virus is, is not going anywhere. So I guess it's all about flattening the curve, as they say, is, is what they're trying to do. Kushner is running this uh, shadow task force and very likely another another movement is going to be the mandatory vaccine uh, movement is really going to get a, a big push after this uh, medical. Absolutely. Scare. And then there's the phone tracking that Bill Gates has been calling for in the past mm -hmm. and, and recently. And look, here's Israeli spyware firm wants to track. It's an SO group. That's NSO why from in that article is NSO group, the people that sell the Pegasus software that's been used by governments around the world, like Saudi Arabia to spy on and then later kidnap and murder people. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to trust them with our data now. I mean, it's just laughable.
that in that article they claim, oh, well, this is the software we're, we're promoting for coronavirus is different because it's for a civilian purpose. I mean, if you really want to trust all these like Unit 8200 and Israeli and Mel- intelligence like front companies and cutouts with all your data and give them all this power. I mean, it's just um, I don't know if you if you think that's safe, you are really naive. That's all I have to say. And you don't know the history. You're, and you're anti-Semitic you if you have a problem with up. this. Whitney, it's anti-Semitic to not want Israel to track you uh, by your phone. I saw. I don't doc- want any government to track me. I yeah. don't want the Chinese government to track me either. Does that make me anti-Chinese? I mean, like, come on. Uh, it, it's ridiculous uh, to make that accusation against people that are raising the alarm about how our civil liberties are disappearing because it's a time of national confusion and panic right now. I saw a documentary about China and the, this Chinese girl opens up her phone and she, there's an app where everybody that's sick, you can see around them. So they're doing this phone tracking thing over there, well. just like they have the facial recognition stuff everywhere over there, which they're going to try to bring here too. They, they also have cameras set up and stuff that you walk through where they can measure your temperature too. And then if you have a high temperature in China, they take you and, and quarantine you and, and put you away. And every few hundred feet, there's somebody measuring your, your temperature as well. It's it, This is the perfect excuse for them to implement like every fantasy they've ever had for yeah. a police state. Well, I, I'm going to have an article coming out in a couple of days. I was planning to have it out early this week, but it's really big. So it might take me some time to put together. But basically... Mm-hmm. Um, the neocons have been planning for a pandemic like this for a long time, and they've been doing simulations really um, for over two decades now about pandemics and what would likely happen. And a lot of what they predicted is coming true. One of these simulations people may know for people that investigated you know, 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, it's called Dark Winter. It involved people, like we mentioned earlier, like James Woolsey, uh, the former CIA director, um, who was uh, apparently, like you said, you said that he is really into Chabad Lubavitch, apparently. Um, but he also, you know, used to be head of the CIA, was involved in these creepy suspending the Constitution martial law plans. Um, that was about, uh, that happened about three months or so, maybe a little more, uh, before 9-11 and before the anthrax attacks and basically predicted the anthrax attacks and set up a narrative of, of oh, Saddam Hussein is going to be guilty um, of releasing anthrax. And, and all this stuff. And well, one of the well, things that came out in that simulation in terms of the government response is that they were going to indefinitely detain people that the government suspected mm-hmm. of having, uh, you know, the, the virus in question in that simulation and that their civil liberties were going to be violated. And that was back in 2001. <clears throat> and since 2001, well, there have been simulation after simulation. The most recent ones happened last year. There were four simulations that the U.S. government did on pandemic pandemic influenza. Remember, coronavirus is a type of influenza, technically, right? So um, they were doing multiple simulations last year. And one, the guy that led that simulation was present at the dark winter simulation before the anthrax attacks that predicted them in 2001. So I think that's really freaking convenient. And the fact that these pandemics all together have this stuff um, – You know, like, oh, civil liberties are going to be violated and there's going to be misinformation on the Internet. We have to censor the Internet. That was in the 2001 exercise. That was in the exercise last year. I mean, this is all very convenient. And let's remember, too, that these simulations we're talking about uh, earlier, cyber reason simulations about the election being super chaotic and being canceled. Then you have, you know, what, a year before 9-11, they simulated planes being flown into into the Pentagon. And, and then right? and then they said, oh, who could have ever predicted that? Who could have ever imagined the failure, that? The failure of imagination excuse, yeah. even though they simulated it a year before. And actually, Cyber Reason, in, in, in the news coverage of, of their simulations, they say that same excuse. We want to avoid the failure of imagination that, mm-hmm. that didn't prevent 9-11. Right. You know, they simulated it a year before and here they are simulating the same stuff. And these are all tied into spooks in the U.S. and Israel. I mean, wake up, people. The enemies are are the military and intelligence operatives that are in the in real control of the country. And then we have the real deep state. Look at this. Trump. I, I, I don't have Washington Post, but it's who could be who could have predicted Trump would be. Such, oh, that's not what it is. Sorry. Trump said something about who could predict, but I don't even have it on the screen. But speaking of anthrax, Alex Azar, who is involved, appointed by Trump here in 
2017 Department of Health and Human Services. He was also George W. Bush's HHS secretary, Tommy Thompson, said Azar played an important role in responding to the 2001 yep. anthrax attacks. And we all know about how fishy, you know, it stinks to high heaven, those anthrax right. attacks. The, the anthrax attacks, a lot of those uh, letters went to congressmen that opposed the Patriot Act and they get anthrax letters. And allegedly they claim for a long time that, oh, that anthrax came from Saddam Hussein. And later it, it's revealed it came from the U.S., Oh, weird. And the guy they accused of, um, you know, being behind it all um, got suicided and the case just went away. Right. So, yeah, yeah, those same people that planned that crap in 2001 and simulated it and then responded to it and then were involved in the FBI investigation last year did four simulations about pandemic influenza uh, coming to the U.S. and creating this huge crisis and there were going to be all these failures of lack of medical equipment and all this stuff that was in the simulations last year. And that's what's happening now. The shit was mm-hmm. planned. And at the same time they were simulating that stuff, Bill Barr was creating his pre-crime system. They, um, you know, all this stuff about, um, that's being put live now in definite detention. Um, you know, uh, the mass surveillance, expanding that, um, predictive policing, uh, all this stuff we've been talking about, that was all being put, you know, put in place last year while they were simulating this crap, right? Yep. And these are the same people, like I said, that were doing these simulations with the anthrax stuff, James Woolsey, the CIA, you know, these are the same people also that were involved in this suspension of the Constitution, martial law, a continuity of government programs that involves the mass indefinite detention of Americans they think are unfriendly or will resist a government like, like a takeover like that. Just you know? like just like com the tech companies Converse and Amdocs that were can, all can, surrounding 9/11 are also being put into you know given responsibilities to protect America as as well. It's a, it's amazing, and, uh, and now they they got us all basically on house arrest. So there's no protesting in the streets you know against the martial law or the mandatory no protests or anything. and they know you're at home there's no protests and they know exactly where you are and and as often as you're on your smartphone or on your computer i mean they know what you're saying and what you're thinking and what you're doing i mean that yeah. that's their plan anyway you know they're trying to keep people isolated um and also having people stuck in their house i mean that has a that has an effect on people cabin fever whatever you want to call it if you're stuck in a small area and you can't move around and have normal freedom of movement. I mean, that has a major impact on our, on our capacity to, to think critically and just function as normal people, you know? And at the same time, a lot of these social media companies, Facebook's a good example, have practiced manipulating newsfeed algorithms to try and manipulate people's emotions and make them more depressed, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's just like on the books, right? I mean, that's documented. Facebook tried to do that. Um, and all or, this or has stress, done studies on that. And all this right, stress and anxiety cycle. and fear mm-hmm. is going to make more people sick. And staying indoors and not getting vitamin D is going to make them sick as well. It's uh, it, it, something else I wanted to mention that we're noticing is these huge bailouts too. And now they're talking about like you know socialism, give everybody two thousand dollars a month if, through the throughout the whole crisis is what I right. saw Bernie say yesterday. Yeah. Totally. This whole economic thing is about restructuring the economic system. So the state is the main force in people's lives and the state will determine who is an essential worker, who can work, who can't work, who gets a check, who doesn't get a check, who who gets to leave their house, who doesn't get to leave their house. Mm -hmm. Who gets to be online and use PayPal and all this kind of stuff that the China documentary, they were like, yeah, if you get in trouble, you're not allowed on Instagram, you're not allowed on 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 the Internet. And, And then like everything you pay through everything your whole life is connected through social media like black mirror and you know they're we're heading there real quick and, and it seems like this crisis is they're going to really move the move the right. ball down the field a and, lot and and let's remember that the the last time there were bailouts in 2008 there were massive protests occupy wall street but if everyone's mm-hmm. stuck in their house uh, where's Occupy Wall Street 2.0? It's not going to happen because mm-hmm. they're keeping they're you know, in a lot of you know places now they have the National Guard to make sure people aren't congregating and aren't, you know, on the streets and things like that. So I am really concerned that long after the threat of the virus fades and, the, and, and worry and concern about the pandemic goes away, a lot of these systems are going to stay in place because once you give the state more power, it's very hard to get that power back for them to relinquish that power. 
right? And we've seen that after 9-11. I mean, just look at historical precedent. The more uh, power, wartime powers, you know, uh, extra constitutional powers that they take, they do not give back in the U.S. I mean, that is just what has happened with history. Um, you should assume that will be the case this time, because to think that, oh, Trump is so great and so powerful that he's going to arrest all the baddies for us, I mean, that is just basically assuming, you know, just looking at the world, like I said earlier, in a very cartoonish um, type of way and not being realistic. And also it, it, it's giving up your individual responsibility to one guy, one leader in the U.S. and assuming that one guy is just going to be able to change this corrupt system that's been in place for like decades and decades and decades. Yeah. Hero um, worship. I think that's really like, naive. Yeah. They, they literally like worship Trump like a hero savior figure. And uh, I don't think that's going to get you uh, anywhere. Another thing I want to touch on before we wrap it up here, I know you got to go, is the people, the advocates for a cashless society and, and one world currency. This is the perfect crisis for them to achieve that. They're saying banknotes spread coronavirus. Right. So we can definitely see that. that. That is definitely another agenda that is being pushed through. And they are also trying to make the solution to that cryptocurrency, government controlled cryptocurrencies, which we've seen them been trying to build up the past couple of years. And Facebook, for example, making their own crypto coin and, and all of this stuff. I mean, that is that's where where we're headed. Um, if these people get what they want, I mean, what they're basically doing is a controlled demolition of the economy, um, and they're going to be able to pick up the pieces and rebuild that system however they want if, you know, people don't resist, basically. Did you see this story, too? This is out of Forbes. Yeah. Coronavirus fight back. Even Israel's top secret Unit 81 has just broken cover for COVID-19. So, look, they're even they're revealing their secret uh, military groups. Look at these soldiers here. They, they, they look like scary. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, they're they're saving the day, just like um, they're going to come out with the vaccine first is what we keep seeing. And now they're sending masks and they're sending medicine all over the place. Uh, you know, in well, let, let's talk about the vaccines for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly what mechanism Israel's is supposed to use, but there's also some companies in the U.S. that are developing a vaccine. And they mm -hmm. are all strategic partners of DARPA. Every single one of the U.S. companies making a coronavirus vaccine is a strategic partner of DARPA that is the Pentagon's super Orwellian and creepy research arm that is basically trying to hook up the human brain to artificial intelligence. If you think that sounds nuts, please Google that um, and look up human uh, machine, human brain machine interface DARPA. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. So these are the people behind... Um, the, the Moderna's uh, RNA vaccine for coronavirus and Inovio's DNA vaccine. There was a report that came out yesterday. I did a report on that in January. There was a report, mainstream report that came out, I think just two days ago saying, yes, actually DARPA is behind all of the technology that both of those companies use. And they are the reason that we have these vaccines so close to being uh so close to being deployed. The RNA vaccine that Moderna developed is skipping animal trials. It's going straight to human trials. It's already started. It could be available in a matter of weeks. What people need to know is that RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines, that's foreign genetic material being inserted into your body and into your cells, that type of, that class of vaccine has never been approved for human use ever in the history of vaccines. They're Other vaccines- to, they're, they're streamlining it right now. Right, so like traditional vaccines, you know, they have like a, a deactivated portion of the virus to create like an antibody response or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what this does instead is that it, it puts genetic material that's supposed to code pieces of the virus into your body and you basically become a what DARPA calls a bioreactor, you know, for all these proteins and stuff like that. Um, and it's never been approved for human use before. They tried to make an RNA vaccine for the Zika virus. I think they also tried to make one for Ebola. Um, they couldn't get them approved. And now they are going to ram this through. No one has any idea about the long term health effects or even the short term health effects. And they're not doing animal trials. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. It's just really in, dangerous. In, in the, the the big swine flu epidemic that happened, I think it was in, in the, the late 70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, didn't they rush out a vaccine and a bunch of people got really sick? And a bunch of people died. Yeah. yeah. More people died from the vaccine than died from the actual virus because there was another, you know, a, a, a pandemic scare. Um, it was also an election year. And uh, it was Gerald Ford. 
uh, running for re-election and he pushed this through. And some people say it's one of the reasons that Carter ended up beating him is because of how, you know, how poor, uh, you know, how how horrific that situation quickly became for people. Um, just really concerning. Um, I mean, it, it's really dangerous to assume that this is safe. I mean, they've already suspended, like I said, they suspended animal trials. They've suspended normal protocols for this to try and ram it through. Um, but even the company that's making the vaccine, Moderna, they've said, we have no idea if it'll be effective or not. Gee, we sure hope it works, you know? Um, it's just, it, it's crazy. And, and one thing that that huge, like 8 billion coronavirus relief bill gave a ton, millions and millions of dollars to that same company to push through this vaccine. I mean, those guys are going to make a killing, but who knows? I, I mean, it seems really unlikely that that vaccine is, is going to be effective because their past ones were not and couldn't even get approved for human use, you know, but it's going to be pushed through just to make people stop panicking and make them safer, make them feel safer. Sorry. Well, there's certainly a lot to be concerned about about uh, with all of this going down. So um, I'm, I know you got to get going, Whitney. Thank you for uh, joining me to discuss this stuff. Uh, I look forward to your your future reports. Everybody, make sure if you're on Twitter, follow her underscore Whitney Webb and bookmark the new well, why i'm still on twitter i think we're gonna see huge deplatforming on a massive scale really soon if you like my work please bookmark my website or bookmark the last american vagabond.com where i'll be publishing a lot of my stuff um i set up um an alternative profile on mastodon i'm also on gab if you prefer that twitter alternative um any other social media alternatives that you like uh let me know on twitter right now why i'm still there and i will sign up you know um but please um, set up alternatives now because so many people in alternative media are expecting to be deplatformed de literally any day now. It could really come at any time considering the current climate we're in. So please, uh, you know, take some time to do it now. I've noticed um, the shadow so banning is, is getting really awful on Twitter right now also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it had been going on for a while. All these programs, all these censorship programs have been going on for a couple years, but they are just taking it to the next level now, and they're going to keep taking it to the next level. Mm -hmm. So don't get complacent. You know, that's that's all I want that, people that's to... That's what QAnon is, too. It's trust the plan. Don't do anything. It's all going to be okay. Or or everybody that's just so focused on, oh, all of this is, is a is a hoax. It's a hoax. There's no virus. It's It's 5G, you know. All yeah, this stuff. so I mean, whatever about, it is about QAnon and and trust the plan. Anyone that's telling you not to trust your own critical judgment and uh, telling you to question everything and use your own discernment and look at the facts and make your own opinion. People that are telling you no, trust authority, ignore your feelings, ignore your thoughts, and trust the plan. Trust I mean, that president. to me just screams psyop. Trust the scream psyop to it me. It does, yes, and it makes me wonder if. The Q psyop was this is its purpose. Is this coronavirus happening right now? Well, whether it was coronavirus or something else, I think you know the, it. Ha, it ha, it's not just right now that the QAnon uh, uh, universe has been pushing and promoting martial law as a solution. Uh, you know where Trump can round up all the baddies. I mean, that has been going on for a while from what I understand. So I think it was more about getting people who would normally normally identify as patriots and resist a type of martial law takeover to actually end up cheering it. I think that was one of its main purposes. And that's what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, everybody, make sure to follow Whitney. Whitney, thanks for coming on. Uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. And uh, hopefully hopefully we'll be able to, uh, in a few months or a few weeks, just look back on all of this as uh, you know and, and laugh. But uh, we'll see. Time will tell. Yeah, I hope so. We'll see. All right. Well, thanks, Whitney. I'm going to wrap it up. Everybody, oops, make sure to like, share, subscribe. Let us know what, uh, what you think in the comments. No more news.org where you can find all the links and I will see you guys again soon. Take care.